I yeah, once I, think uh, it's I once gave it a go and I got to week seven, but then by then my knees were like coconuts, so I had to stop. Right, we are going to be live in Facebook any second. Ooh, okay. Meeting is now streaming live on Facebook, and I shall say hello to everybody once I'm sure I can see us. Oh, hang on, I think I've got us. We're on. <laughs> Welcome everybody once again. Um, for those of you who've been following me, you'll know that several times I've had the wrong name and my lovely colleague Lisa taught me how to change my name. So I am indeed Benedict from Family Voice Surrey and I'm thrilled to be joined by Eamon Gilbert from Surrey County Council. Um, Eamon, what I've tended to do is start by asking the person I'm talking to to introduce themselves in case they okay. didn't watch yeah. the presentation. Um, so I think we'll start there. Who are you? What do you do? <laughs> Oh, uh, hi, my name's uh, Eamon Gilbert, as Benedict said. I'm the uh, uh, Assistant Director for Commissioning for SEND in Surrey County Council, and I've got a particular remit interest in preparing for adulthood and a kind of post-16 agenda. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So I know I, I had the, the pleasure of watching your presentation that you recorded earlier, um, and we've been getting questions from parent carers throughout the, the last couple of days. So my job here really is to field those and we can have a bit of a chat. What we tend to find is it it kind of goes off in various tangents and mm -hmm. the, the more informal, the better in a sense. So um, this parent says, starts nicely by saying, I find the existence of the service really encouraging, but <laughs> um, what happens if my child's ready to finish school, but there isn't enough capacity to support the next steps? So do we have to choose to stay at school or college or wait unemployed in, until services kick in? Oh, no, absolutely not. So um, one of the key things that we're, we've done over the past year and we're looking to increase again for the next academic year is to increase the number of vocational pathway places we've got to meet demand. I mean, obviously, one of the, the tensions for us is that if we create more places than we can fill, obviously, that creates a cost, if you like, but but we would absolutely uh, be supportive of, uh, of anyone who wanted to go down that pathway. I think the most important thing is to let your uh, case officer or someone in the SEND team know that that's where you've got an interest or obviously, you know, your child's got an aspiration in that area. Um, we significantly increased the number of places, for example, with um, sorry choices for a pre-supported internship programme and their supported internship programme this year we will look to increase those places again for the next academic year. We increased them uh, this year as much as we could because we had to strike a balance between the quality of the service and the number of places that we would have liked. And, you know, after having a long, um, you know, a lot of meetings and discussions with, uh, sorry, choices, we agreed on, on the number of, of 50, um, not because we didn't want to do more and not because the funding wasn't there. It was because we were worried in terms of the impacts on their recruitment and upskilling their staff that the quality of the offer uh, wouldn't be as good. And obviously that's what we want it to, to we want it to be, we want it to be really successful. The other thing I would say is that it isn't always a single year scenario. So it might well be that uh, someone who's interested in being on an employment pathway, you know, might take a kind of phased multi-year approach or it might be initially a college course um, at one of the further education colleges with a with an interest in a vocational specific vocational pathway that then builds into pre supported internship, supported internship, or supported internship and apprenticeship, whatever their their ability is. And and the most important thing is that you know we we're not just creating kind of um, you know flat employment scenarios. Obviously, there are certain skills in employment that are standard, but you know if someone's got a particular interest in a particular sector. Then we'd like to support that as well. So, for example, there's been a kind of real increase in interest in gaming type mm -hmm. programs, um, you know. And so, what we'd want to do is try and commission that. But what we're very much trying to do is not look at what's available as we get to September 21. It's to understand in advance what we need and commission that in advance of 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 it being required. So, the more information we can get from families and and obviously from young people where it's appropriate about what they're interested in and what they would like to do. That is absolutely what we'd like to do. And for all Thank of the young you. people, yeah. oh, sorry, that was too long an answer, no, sorry. That's fine. Oh, it's just, there are so many questions. No, 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 sorry, yeah. I, I, yeah um, I, it's no problem at all. And this kind of fits in, I suppose, with another question. Um, and, and I wonder, because I can imagine the juggling act between that demand and 
capacity it must be quite tricky um i know we've had quite a lot of people who've been quite concerned and it's summed up by this question which says are arrangements fully in place for all the young people that left school in transition this year and this person has said both those with and without an ehcp um in, given that you have this small thing that you're building on do you i suppose the big question is do we have young people at the moment that have fallen through the net a little bit no, no, I don't think we've got young people that have fallen through the net. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the pandemic has created a real uh, a stress in the system, if you like. But mm. in terms of the numbers of people that wanted to go into uh, vocational pathway programmes, we've still got some spaces on some of those programmes. Uh, obviously, geography plays a part because Surrey's a very big place. But we're, we're not aware of a significant um, or, or a, a, you know, a meaningful uh, gap in, in those provisions. I think... Partly that's because we're still doing the piece of work like we are today to actually raise awareness that um, the approach in Surrey has changed and that, you know, we're not asking families to uh, relinquish an EHCP in order to go onto a vocational pathway. Um, you know, our, our data shows that, you know, from last September, from September 19 to now, we've increased the numbers going into vocational pathways, but we've still got an awful lot of post-16 and post-19 young people who still are in effect in a school environment, even though that isn't necessarily going to be their adult destination. So, um, you know, we, we are really gearing up for those provisions. And obviously with uh, with our four large colleges, they have a huge uh, additional capacity that doesn't require capital investment. It really just requires them having a level of certainty around the kind of programmes that we would want, to, want them to put in place. Yeah, um, thank you. So I, the next question that I've got is, it follows on because one of the things is that we, we do hear from young people post 16, post 19, who, who are still stuck with no provision um, and who do feel like they've fallen out. So it, that's, there's a, I suppose, a bit of a, a stress there Well, I'm wondering. And one of, the, um, one of the questions is, touches on that asking if there's any plan to help people who've just missed the Next Steps programme. And the example that's given is they may have come off an EHCP, perhaps due to a now failed employment path, they're under 25, they need help. How could they then take advantage of that system or access something? So there are, obviously, the, 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 the providers themselves have funding from the Education and Skills Funding Agency for pupils that don't have an EHCP to access many of these programmes. Uh, one of the things that we're very much looking at this year in terms of uh, uh, gearing up, which I appreciate, you know, when I say this year, I mean for September 21, is to increase the availability of uh, careers information for, for young people, especially in year 11 within the HCP. That's not quite re resourced yet, um, but, but we are aware that that's a significant issue. I think navigating the system is a, is a major issue for everybody. Um, as you know, we've produced the brochure which sets out the post-16 uh, vocational pathways that are available in Surrey, that's uh, available on the local offer website. I mean, following this, we, we can circulate that. And, uh, um, you know, obviously all of these provisions are geared up to uh, support young people, uh, whether they've got an EHCP or not. I'm thinking about the general further education colleges. And you can just contact them directly and talk about, you know, ask about enrolment, et cetera. So, uh, so that shouldn't be a barrier. Um, but if it is, then please let us know. Right, lovely. Um, this one's quite interesting. This parent is concerned that there could be a con conflict of interest between school and next steps. Um, so must school involve or let parents know the next step, pro next step program is even an option? And I think there seems to be particularly a concern that non-maintained schools with sixth form capacity might not wish parents to know that there's an alternative pathway, might potentially more appropriate than their own offering because of course, it could be to their financial de detriment. Uh, I, I understand the uh, potential for the conflict of interest. I mean, we were obviously very closely with our schools. It, it may be more of an issue in the independent sector rather mm. than with our own phase schools. Um, not that many of our own phase schools have actually got a, a post-16 option, but those that have, we work very closely with. And, you know, I would believe certainly for our own schools that, that everyone's working for the best interests of the young person. I think um, you may not have seen the presentation, but I think there's probably a real difference in, in that in terms of those that are on the adult social care pathway uh, and those that aren't um, going to meet the threshold for adult services in that I would assume that those that are uh, going on the pathway for adult services, that they probably 
will um, will stay in school a, a little bit longer. Um, mm. But but it's not set in stone, if you like. There, there is legislation around careers guidance that applies to all schools um, that they are responsible for their in inverted commas careers guidance. Um, but but I I've not come across that as a as an issue in this scenario. I think there has been in the past an issue in mainstream education about the tension between um, more vocational post 16s options and schools that have got um, six forms, but I'm not aware of that being an issue in SEND and I, I would hope it wouldn't be. I think it's partly about us as reaching out and informing as many families as possible so they can ask those questions of the schools directly, but but I'm not aware of any school that, that is deliberately holding on to young people. Yeah. Financial I think the concern was more from the independent sector, but I suppose one of the things is, is for parents, it would be really reassuring to know that the schools are equipped with all of the information about this to hand on to parents, because it often feels as though the onus is on parents to know about something like Next Steps mm -hmm. and to inform the school, which can be I, quite frustrating. I, I know I said this in the, in the presentation, but I think a really kind of uh, cut through question that you can share with the school um, that your, your your child's attending is, um, you know, asking about obviously their individual progress, but also asking, you know, based on their progress and their needs, where do you see them, you know, what do you see them being, where do you, what, what do you see them doing when they're, for example, 20 or 25? And that tends to cut through a lot of the conversation, which can get bogged down in, you know, what do you want your child to do next year? And often the response to that will be, what they did last year and that's partly because obviously for young people you know if they're happy and they're enjoying the program they're on you know change is a challenge and, and it can create some level of anxiety but bearing in mind for about 84 percent of the the young people that we've got post 16 currently that they will um, at some point not have any hcp either because it will expire at 25 or it will cease and they're not open to adult services it's really important that, that we're focused on what they're going to be doing as young ad adults and ensuring that they've got the skills and they've got as much support as possible to achieve that. Because at some point for those young people, the, the targeted uh, support and the additional resources they get embedded in the legislation will, will end, whether it's mm. because a plan's been ceased or because it's expired. So it's really important that we are jointly looking to the future and making sure that they're undertaking a program that, that will help them reach that adult destination rather than necessarily just feeling comfortable next year. And I suppose one of the phrases we use is, uh, you know, what, what, what's life, what will life after school look like? Um, that fits in beautifully with this next question. And this is one that I've heard repeated in, in kind of normal, rather than just in this event, it comes up quite a lot. What should I do as a parent if I think school have treated the year nine transition paperwork as a tick box exercise? Um, so often in there, there's that section isn't there on preparation for adulthood and schools m more often than I would like because I hear about it a lot would just write a, a tiny sentence under that community inclusion independent living independent travel skills health pathways if so the, the parent here says is that what a, a year nine transition report is supposed to be if that if so it's really disappointing um, how can we ensure that changes and as a parent if that's happened is that what, what's the pathway to challenge that yeah i think i think that's a really good question because obviously one of the things that is slightly different um around the way that the structure of a send uh, program works is obviously the local authority provides the funding and the additional funding and has a monitoring kind of regime if you like around outcomes and, and what that might look like but but that doesn't it isn't intended in any way to undercut the ability of the family and the parents to to offer their own challenge to the school and again i think you know as i was just saying i think you know the in the legislation the year nine review is seen as a key milestone review where you begin that process of thinking about the adult destination the adult outcome you know where, where they're going to what they're going to be doing etc if you're unhappy with it and you feel that it hasn't been sufficiently addressed as you would do, you know, with a mainstream pupil at a parents evening, you're completely at liberty to go back and say, you know, I don't think this really uh, reflects what what I need to know, what what my child needs to know and, and challenge that. And I think by phrasing the question around, you know, based on their current trajectory, what would you see them, their current interests? What would you see them doing, for example, when they're 20? It kind of gets it out of that 
silo of it just being about the year nine review and more about that future trajectory. Yeah. And I th so one of the things that we often get stuck in, and I think it's probably true of, of the three bits, sorry, Al, um, is we, as a parent, you're often in part of a trio. So you've got you, you've got the school, and you've got the your send caseworker or the local authority. So if if I found myself, I've had this year nine review, and actually I feel that we haven't done exactly what you suggest, which say, what what does this life at 20 or 25 look like? I, I suppose my question in that thing is, should I be talking to the school to challenge that? Should I be talking to my caseworker? Should I be doing both together um, to try and avoid the, the conflict that in that threesome we often in reality find ourselves? Yeah, I, I think initially that conversation, you know, and you can obviously do it with the, the, the representative at the annual review from the county council, uh, but primarily it's the school. You know, I, I think that, you know, we, we talk about annual reviews, but I mean, and obviously there's legislation and the way that's set up, but in effect, they are kind of huge uh, parents evenings or parents mm. meetings where, you know, obviously the child's involved as well, but, but effectively it's like, in the same way that you might prepare for a mainstream parents evening, you know, when you're, you know, meeting with a teacher or whatever, it might be, well, you know, how, how is my child progressing? How, what progress are they making? What's the outcome? Obviously, we don't necessarily have the structure of academic qualifications in quite the same way, but 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 you'll know in your own mind what you would like them to have achieved. There should be within the plan and obviously in the previous annual review progress they should make. And then, you know, building that conversation around, well, you know, what does that mean for their future? Are they on course to achieve what I, you know, what we previously discussed that they might do? They've got a specific interest in this. How are you going to support that? And I think sometimes the the bureaucracy and the technicality around the annual review sometimes makes it difficult to to sort of view it in that way as a as a real opportunity for you to hold the education provider to account for the work or you know that they're that they're 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 doing with the young person they're providing and then obviously you know you can go to the local authority if you're unhappy with that as an outcome yeah. but it but it's really about the 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 provider that's that's there that's actually, you know, in the classroom every day providing education and or training and, and what outcomes are they achieving and how does that work? You know, I do think that sometimes it can it can devolve into a conversation about how happy they are. And while mm -hmm. I completely understand that from my own personal circumstances, um, the, uh, the, the, it's really important that it actually is about, you know, education and, and learning as well as, you know, how, how they feel in, in, the, yeah. in the placement that they're in. It's very strange, isn't it? I know I, I, it's been a very, very long time since I was in a mainstream school parents' evening. And, and in the SEND world, we get so conditioned to having that extra layer. And it, it can be really difficult as a parent to know which bit of the system we should be talking to. So thank you for that. Um, a totally different change of track now. Um, can Surrey County Council put a requirement on non-maintained SEND schools to provide bikeability training? So this parents asked for this on a couple of occasions, each time told it was a good idea, but nothing's come of it. Okay, I, I mean, I, I probably need to know more about that provider. I don't think that we could contractually insist that bikeability is provided. I mean, Surrey County Council does have a big bikeability program that has, um, um, you know, uh, 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 enhanced access for young people with an EHCP where it's appropriate. And we've also got um, SEN Transport, which we prefer to call Transport Assistance. And, you know, one of the things we're doing this year with the introduction of independent travel training is looking to diversify some of the arrangements around that. So, I mean, I'd be really happy to look at that individually. I don't think it's probably about forcing the school to provide it, but I do think there are other avenues and other ways of accessing that support that we could definitely look into and, and try and facilitate. I think, you know, um, as I said in the presentation, you know, one of the key things that we're trying to uh, look at in terms of the way that transport assistance is described is that, you know, for, for many of the young people within the ACP, it, it can create a dependence. And what we really want to do, especially as they, you know, turn 16 or potentially in secondary as they get older, the skill of being able to travel independently is really important, for example, if you want to be employed, because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you're not going to get a taxi from your employer unless you work for, you know, 
Apple, but you know that's that's not point not not one percent of the population. So you know we are we are we are needing to upskill children. And I think there's a tipping point as children get older, um, where it becomes that although it, it creates p potentially you know more stress, the need to move away from the convenience option to the strength and uh, you know independence option kicks in, and that's usually around sixteen. Mm. Thank you. That's really I mean, good. It sounds like, again, it's talking to the school and, and maybe encouraging them to talk to you if it's necessary and getting something moving. Um, I really like this. What I'm really loving about these questions is that there's a flavour of the story of the person. Now, I don't have names or anything. I've just got the questions. Um, this one really rang a, rang a bell with me because of my experience with one of my children. The question initially is, do you think that in some cases, looking to the future at the end of Key Stage 3 is actually a bit late, given your desire to get our children real world ready in reasonable time. So in, in this case, they say it would have been useful at the end of Key Stage 2 to ask the question, is this a child who actually will be capable of GCSEs? And in that case, the answer was obviously no, but he was made to follow the national curriculum for the next three years, which in this, you know, the parent says that was actually a total waste of time and money. Um, if he could have followed a different pathway earlier, he'd have he'd have done better. I think in I had a different circumstance, but similar. If my if one of my children could have accessed a kind of BTEC style course at the beginning of secondary, it's likely that he'd have had a much more successful educational experience. I mean, a lot depends on the the nature of the the school, whether it, you know it would be a special school or. A, a mainstream school because obviously that you know there are statutory obligations that schools have got around the national curriculum especially around the mainstream uh, schools I, I do think that often as well sometimes it, it's worth flagging up that professionals who are involved with the family I mean it goes without saying don't know the child as well as as the family do that's just completely obvious but also they can be uh, reluctant to ask what might be received as a very, very difficult question or, or give, um, you know, what might be quite challenging information. And, and, you know, while I'm not wishing to put the burden on families, if families can instigate those conversations, often, you know, that, that might open a door. I know, for example, the opposite of what your question, uh, your question, uh, question have put forward is that sometimes families will will in, insist that children can do GCSEs or even go into do A-levels when the professional input is actually that that's not going to be an outcome based on their disability. And so it can work both ways. But but I think it's there's a kind of an issue in the dialogue that sometimes professionals don't feel that they can ask those questions and families don't feel it's appropriate for them to ask the professionals. And yeah. I think sometimes it, it's just about being open and asking that question if it's a concern. And then obviously, you know, I can't be assured that necessarily the answer will be will be the perfect one in terms of that. But I do think, you know, professionals who are there doing a job won't necessarily feel comfortable asking a question that might have a really significant kind of emotional impact. It's really difficult, isn't it? Because actually, a lot of the time we talk a lot about the fact that for parent carers, most of us are doing this for the first time and we don't have the experience of you know teacher or a doctor or a therapist and and so although yes you're right we do know our children we also kind of need that professional's experience and expertise and in the same way that a doctor may not enjoy giving you a bad prognosis for a, a physical mm -hmm. thing actually they kind of have to because you can't you you don't have that experience or expertise to be able to ask the question it's uh, but i i agree they're really difficult conversations aren't they and and again i don't want to keep banging on about it but one of the reasons i think that question around you know what you know at any age it doesn't have to be you know when you're 16 you could ask this question when you're eight is you know based on my child's current abilities and and trajectory and their disability you know what, what, what do you see them doing when they're 20 can draw out an awful lot of that conversation without it being quite as challenging scenario because you're talking about something that's obviously you know long term in the future but it can make a real difference in terms of the curriculum they access and the support they get that's a really good tip thank you um okay i i don't know if you'll know the answer to this question but i it it's it feels relevant is that um is it possible to access something that is not the national curriculum if that's actually in the best of interest of the child 
before key stage four? Or are we, are we often feel just stuck in that channel, which sometimes just doesn't feel like it fits very well. I, I, I will follow this up because I can't give a kind of, you know, a, a certain answer, but my, my sense is that if you're in a mainstream school, um, regardless of the, um, you know, the nature of the disability, you're probably in a scenario where by and large, you will have to follow the national curriculum. Uh, obviously in a, in a, in a unit in a school or, or potentially um, in a resource center or in a special school that varies, but, but, you know, the legislation and, and the way that, um, you know, schools are judged around Ofsted and league tables does make it very difficult for schools to offer an enhanced curriculum. Now that changes at 16 or in year 12, yeah. but in the, you know, in, in the main phase, um, you know, of primary and secondary, it is a very tightly controlled curriculum. But yeah. to be honest, that's not my area of, of real expertise. So I would like to go away and, and check that. But then I can give that answer to Benedict uh, from probably Jane Winterbone would be a better place to answer that than me. Thank you. That's that's and I I love the fact that we can have that exchange of this is the question. Oh, not sure. We'll follow it up um, because goodness knows none of us are superhuman, are we? Um, Oh, I don't know how to. How do you ensure that schools pass on the relevant information to parents in terms of future pathways? I suppose that echoes a little bit what we were talking about, doesn't it? Yeah, oh, and, yeah. and clearly that that's kind of an emerging theme. Um, mm. We we've done a lot of work this year to increase our understanding of, especially the independent sector, and we we've done a, a large piece of work around kind of um, updating contracts and, and and what we call schedule twos, which set out at least in a limited fashion um, outcomes for the for the child or the young person. Um, we we obviously make things available on the local offer website, but I do understand that is a very static um, medium. I think when it was first, you know, put in the legislation in 2014, it was a kind of dramatic and positive step. Um, but, you know, it, it's now got so much stuff on it that actually a lot of people will find it difficult to navigate. And that is something that we're looking at, but, but I appreciate that. I think, I think it's more about knowing where to go if you feel that is um, the issue. As I said, we've created um, a brochure for uh, uh, all of our vocational pathway provision in, in Surrey. We're currently working on something similar for all of our own special schools so that there's a single document that families can go to where they can see you know, we're very, very fortunate in Surrey that we've got some amazing, you know, we've got, we've got 25 special schools all offering an amazing offer. Um, you know, the vast majority are good and outstanding in terms of Ofsted, um, but they've tended to market themselves individually rather than, you know, as a group. So one of the things we're working on for September 21 is to have a document that families can go to that, you know, understands the differences between those schools. And as you may be aware, um, the cabinet recently signed off a, a really significant um, capital funding program of 36 million to expand our special schools um, initially in September 21 and then beyond, because we're recognising that you know we need more local places in our really good schools, and we need you know to offer people um, the opportunity to go to a local school wherever possible, um, you know, to reduce our reliance on out of county, and 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 so you know that that will be an ongoing program, but. But yeah, I, 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 I'm picking up this theme and I think we this is really helpful for me because I think we need to think more about that. Um, and maybe it's something we need to be much more active on. Uh, mm. It's not something we've actively kind of pursued in the past, but I definitely think that's something for me to take away and look at. Um, but initially our response is to try and provide as much information and, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, as possible to families so that they can navigate that. But, but you yeah, know, I will definitely take that away and think about it. Thanks. I think it'd be really, if, if this, I suppose, in an ideal world as a parent, if I could go to my Senko and say, well, you know, I want to know my son's in year 10 and I'd like to know what are the options open after, and for, for the Senko to pull out, you know, a leaflet or, or click on a link and say, this is all that's available with the little descriptions. That would just, because as we hear so much, school is the first port of, contact isn't it it's the place that we know and and that's kind of i suppose in a mainstream setting that's you'd be talking to your school and, wouldn't you and and you know in some ways i suppose i get it more than most in that you know i've only been with sorry for a year and uh you know i didn't know any of the schools when i first arrived so now i've got them all embedded in my head but but 
you know, that's from meeting the, the heads. That's from going to endless meetings. You know, if if you're at home, you've got your day job. You know, you, you both potentially both parents work. Now you haven't got time to do that, and we need to put it into a space where it's just easy and accessible, and where families can can find that and say, yeah, that offer looks like the one I want. Now, that, how do I get that at school? And I would say the other thing about that is that even if you've got the time and the resource and the capacity to, to do the looking, um, it can be extraordinarily difficult, um, particularly when we know there are that there's a, a wealth of different offers, some of which are independent. And I have yet to find the place where I can see everything in one place. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, we, we, yeah. When we did the um, the um, Next Steps uh, meetings last autumn, which hopefully some of the people who will look at this came to, I think one of the things that that struck me was that um, many, you know, I, I many of them came up to me afterwards and said, you know, if I'd known about that, my son or daughter wouldn't be where they are now because I thought that was all that was available. And there is definitely a theme of, you know, really opening up what, what the opportunities are, where they lead to, etc. And as I say, you know, most people will struggle to understand what a further education college does. We've got four in Surrey that are, you know, we've got such a range of, of offer, you know, and they do so much around providing additional support for young people in those colleges. So, you know, it isn't just enrolling and being part of this big class. They've got classes where you can have enhanced support on a mainstream program for someone with SEND. They've got um, classes where they're only uh, intended for young people with SEND, like Mary's Wood at Guildford College, you know, but but so few people are aware of it. And that's part of what we really need to do is, is upskill everyone for that. And so you know, we, actually, we, can can I interrupt you there? Sorry, Eamon, yeah. because uh, four or five questions down on my list, but I'm going to jump to that one, is about those four colleges. Um, so the questions are, can you name them, please? Are they for 16 to 19, 19 plus or both? Uh, they are all uh, 16 to 19 plus. Uh, and they've put me on the spot now. I've got Guildford College, East Surrey East College, Surrey College. Nescott and... Brooklands. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they're few. We've got some other ones as well, like Godalming and, and various others as well, but they're the four main uh, general further education colleges. And I think what I, what I would say is... Um, for, for those, I'm, I'm in the thick of this world with my three, so I, I've become aware of a lot of things. And um, I would say one of the things we often hear in the same world about Marist Wood, it's important to know that Marist Wood is part of Guildford College. So Guildford yeah. has a number of campuses. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. and, and I, I use that as an example because I think people would be surprised to know that the, um, you know, the, the level of support and the high needs of the young people that go you know, to Mary's Wood, um, you know, you wouldn't think that that's something that a, a general further education college would do. But, you know, it's it's a fantastic program and a great opportunity for young people to be in a slightly bigger environment, but not one that's overwhelming and massive. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if it, it's we might still be able to do it, although it's looking increasingly difficult. But one of the things we were hoping to do this year was to arrange um, open day events for families or, you know, for parents to go to each of the college campuses and get a sense of, you know, that would be just for um, uh, families where, where they've got a child with SEND. Unfortunately, circumstances are meant that we can't run that, but but that is definitely something we were looking at and we will be doing in the future, hopefully. Great. Um, I'm going to get back to my questions because I could talk about this for ages, but... Um, my answers are too long, aren't they? That's the problem. No, 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 no. I think that... The, but the beauty of doing something like this is that you get human answers and, and what you're able to demonstrate actually is the amount of thought and the passion that you have to get this right so I think it's fab um, so this parent says that given a recent additional diagnosis they think that their child could possibly be eligible for the adult social care pathway um, and and they feel that there are more opportunities available in terms of being supported into work gaining functional independence if that is the case how do I kickstart being on the relevant people's radar so there is a transitions team that was created last year, which is run by um, Steve Hook, who I believe has done one of these sessions. Mm -hmm. um, um, they, uh, one of their roles now is to do what we call um, an early assessment. So access to adult services would normally kick in at 18. Um, um, children and young people, young people are assessed under Section 14, I think, of the CARE Act. 
um, it's a much higher threshold than children's services. And I think that's something that a lot of families aren't aware of. But, um, but that team, uh, which Paul Baker is the lead of, um, their role is to uh, work with us to identify um, young people who may well be in the future on the adult pathway um, in year nine or in year 11, so at 14 or 16, to do an indicative assessment which would allow the young person and the family to be aware that in all likelihood, for example, they would be on the adult social care pathway or alternatively okay, they won't meet threshold. And, uh, and if, if you could uh, contact um, someone and just ask to be referred to the, um, to the transitions team. In, so uh, let me just pause you there, contact someone. I think that's the key thing. Is it, are we talking about contacting your SENCO are you, or a social worker if you have one, presumably? Who's well, the I, someone? Yeah, I think it's probably initially the case officer, but I think if that uh, is a problem, then... Um, they could probably contact um, uh, Merlin De Costa. I can give you her details after this, and then she could she could collate those, and you know we we could get those in. So, yeah, I mean that team has been absolutely one hundred percent set up entirely for this purpose, and we wouldn't want to miss anyone. Uh, and I do think it's really helpful for families to to know, you know, it can't necessarily be definitive because things can change in two years, but but you know it, it is quite binary in the sense that that if you know you're going to be in the adult social care pathway, what you might, you know, the kind of program of learning that you might want your child to undertake, um, so from 16 to 18, might be around life skills, might be around learning how to live independently, might be about learning to travel independently rather than being a very academic program. Uh, and alternatively, if they're not going to meet that threshold, then, then we can look again at, you know, what that might be. And it might mean that actually they're more, um, able and, and they're going to be on the uh, on the vocational pathway but it, it does provide a sense of clarity and I think for those families where they're not unsure then you know that is that is an avenue that they can pursue. Brilliant thank you. Um, we, we had we were really fortunate to have um, Christina Earl from Surrey Choices give a presentation and then I spoke to I want to say Nikki and Rachel but I may have the names wrong I've spoken to so many people this week um, who did one of these live Q&A sessions and this this question comes into it. It's difficult to completely understand as a parent carer how Sorry Choices fits in. They sound like they have an amazing offer, but on the one hand, it felt as though they were very firmly within the adult social care pathway. On the other hand, it seems as though they're actually offering some vocational pathways. How do young people with SEND, both with and without an EHCP, access support from them and how, how is it funded? So the work that we've been doing with them this year has been primarily around young people with an EHCP. I think the change that we made um, around, you know, the last year, so in the run up to the last academic year, was that for the first time we commissioned in children's services for, um, for Surrey Choices, because in the past it had been an adult uh, social care programme. And we, we, we commissioned our own places in children's services so that people can access that at a younger age. Um, they are funded for us to provide um, places for um, young people 16 to 18. So, you know, that that's just locked in and we've done that. And as I said, you know, there was a, a, a change in policy whereby, you know, if families um, or young people wanted to undertake a vocational pathway, there wouldn't, there, there would, there would be a, you know, there would be an assurance that the EHCP would remain while they were on the programme. And I think that was probably a big change. But there was also an understanding that we needed to commission different kinds of provision rather than school. Um, you know, an awful lot, I think it was as high as 70% of our post-16 EHCPs, uh, you know, in 29, September 2019 were in school provisions. And that's great. No, you know, no one's saying that they shouldn't be. Other than that, you know, you don't really want to go straight from school into, into a bigger and broader world without something in between. And I think because of the nature of EHCPs and because, you know, plans expire or they cease, that, that that was happening. And I think the other side to that as well is that we've got young people in their 20s in residential provisions. Many of them have been residential for a long time, um, you know, outside the county. And I think it's really important that they acclimatise back to Surrey um, before their EHCP um, expires. And, you know, we've tried to encourage that this year rather than, families staying right up to the to the you know the young person staying right up to the edge and then coming back to a 
profoundly different environment that they haven't really had a chance to acclimatise to within the HCP. It's been, I know we, I personally had an experience where my, one of my children was in residential um, for, for a number of years and he came back still with his EHCP um, and he came back home and it's, it was a really, it was a really difficult transition actually and it, it's sort of been successful-ish I mean, you know, he's still with us and we love him dearly and we are helping him, um, he no longer has that EHCP but it's true that there is, there's a big adjustment and I think for a lot of, and certainly the way that it happened with us, we just had to kind of scrabble around and try and support him the best that we could. But it it was it was tough. And I can imagine that for a young person who can't come home for all sorts of reasons to move from one residential, from residential school to a more local, very different provision could be really quite traumatic in a lot of ways. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it, it, it's more um, it's more difficult when they're they're taking it right up to the edge of their EHCP. I think you know if it's if it's before the EHCP is going to expire, then it it does give a chance for that acclimatisation. And I think you know while I wouldn't want to generalise because there are exceptions um, for most of the young people within the EHCP in residential provision, they will at some point come back and live in Surrey. You know that is the mm-hmm. expectation, that's the intention, and the more planned. And the more lead in there can be to that 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 return, the better it will be, and the more successful it will be. And I, uh, the other thing, I suppose, it's really important to mention at the other end. You talked in your presentation about uh, a minority, but an important minority of mm. our young people who move on to universities. So for whom that school, that academic provision, is really important. And yeah. and I know from conversations that we've had in other times that you're very aware of it. But I know. From it's important for the parents for whom that applies that they know that that is still on your radar. Yeah, and I think you know I think you've touched on a really important point there. I think one of the things that you know is is tricky is that obviously you know we've got ten thousand six hundred EHCPs in Surrey, it's one of the largest uh, co- co- uh, SEN cohorts in the country. Um, there is a huge range within that group. Um, you know, from from one end to the other. And we have a significant minority who will go to university at, at, at 19 uh, and, you know, and will be very successful. But for example, things like independent travel training is, is really important to them. Clearly, they're more able. You know, many of them are, you know, very, very bright young people. But but if it, it, it's a kind of doing skill rather than, an, you know, you, you can't learn to travel independently by reading a book. You've really got to do it. And and there is a huge kind of you know transition there as well. And again, many families may not realise that um, you know within the legislation, once a child is enrolled or a young person, I should say, is enrolled at university, their EHCP automatically expires. And there are access arrangements, um, uh, you know, which universities have, which is their equivalent of that support. But for example, it may not provide health support around physio or OT. And it's important that families understand, you know, the young people understand those those changes as well in that, you know, they're moving into that different environment and it, there will still be support there, you know, while they're at university, but but it, it will be different to what they've experienced under an EHCP. And for some young people, that's nothing, but for other young people, it can be, it can be a real change. Yeah. Can I ask you it, it, that bit, sorry, I'm going to come back when we were talking about sorry choices. Um, the funding of it is seems a little bit confusing. So we have, we know that within adult social care, if, if you're in that program, you, you can access that support. Um, when obviously you've talked about the, it being commissioned for children's services, we've had a number of young people who've been told that they can access it, but only if they fund it themselves. Um, yeah, how so- does that all work? So um, if they haven't, if they've got an EHCP, it can be funded, obviously, by Surrey County Council and the um, and and you know through our, the our, our funding through Send etc. If they haven't got an EHCP, there is uh, a regime around um, uh, fees for sixteen to eighteen year olds. Uh, for nineteen year olds, um, I believe that it can be funded directly by the ESFA. But again, I'd like to go away and, and source that and, and find that out. Great. Can um, I just ask you, sorry, you said letters and I don't know what the letters meant. ESFA, was it? Sorry, the <laughs> Education and Skills Funding Agency, which is the uh, post-16 funding agency for England. So 
whether you're doing an apprenticeship or you're going to a further education college or you're in a school sixth form, um, that nationally is funded by the ESFA. That's great. I wonder, is there somewhere where that kind of information would sit for, for parents to find out about? Or would Surrey Choices have that information? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure we could we could pull something together. I mean, obviously, you know, the ESFA has got its own website and there's funding there. It is a bit challenging probably to navigate for, for people. But yeah, I'm sure we could pull something together about how, how, how non-EHCP funding works. I think that would be incredibly and, well... And it, and it's probably worth saying that for every um, placement post-16 within EHCP, um, the first £5,000 of the placement is funded by the ESFA. Great. Thank you. Um, 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 sorry, there are things coming at me fast, fast and furiously. Um, how has COVID affected progress of, of your plan with, for those with learning disabilities and autism, particularly at transition? Um, I think it's probably had an impact in two areas. One is obviously, you know, we talked about the employment pathways and that's become more challenging. But I'm I'm really pleased to say that actually, you know, we, as far as I'm aware, we haven't had anyone who's had to end their program because of uh, because of COVID. Um, some programs have been delayed, obviously, because of the national lockdown. But um, but, you know, so choice has been fantastic. And the other providers that we work with, including the colleges, I think probably uh, the other end of the spectrum in terms of the impact has been that some young people were ready and had planned to um, make the transition into adult services. And um, due to the national lockdown, there was a delay in, uh, in, in um, adult colleagues being able to um, source the appropriate accommodation and the support. And so that meant that they uh, stayed in their, in their current provisions for longer than perhaps, you know, we would have originally envisaged, but, but you know, we, we believe that 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 will be uh, that that will be you know okay for for the summer. I mean, obviously we okay. don't know exactly where we're going to be now, but we think it will probably be okay for for July for those transitions to take place. But but they've probably been the two biggest impacts. And do you know how this new lockdown is? Is is it just kind of continuing with the same kind of impact or? Have there well, been this, this, different this mitigations lock, you've been able to, to yeah use? i think i think that the key difference with this lockdown compared to the previous one is schools colleges universities are open and mm -hmm. the government has effectively made a commitment whereby they've said you know no matter you know how um strict the lockdown might be that their intention is and i, I understand that you know circumstances change that they would seek to keep education and training provision open for as long as possible in order to uh to 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 ensure that young people don't have a long period out uh, again from uh, from from school or college. Sorry, my my dog's um, kicking off in the background. So that's absolutely fine. Sorry. Um, I I you talked about um starting a send apprenticeship program with within Surrey County Council. So this parent says, how can we find out more? And do you need local businesses and organisations to sign up? Yeah, so there's two strands to that. So, uh, yeah, any local business or organisation that would want to be part of that, we'd be over the moon to hear from them and want to work with them and drive that forward. Um, but the other strand that I was talking about was we actually want to create uh, a SEND apprenticeship programme where uh, at least some of the apprentices are actually uh, apprentices to Surrey County Council. And uh, obviously, you know, that's going to take a lot of planning, especially in the current environment. But but we're really hopeful that will be in place uh, in time for the next academic year. And obviously, initially, there will probably be a limited number of places. But, um, you know, S Surrey County Council has a huge range of services, um, you know, uh, not just, you know, um, office based, but obviously you know, lots of other things around housing and parks and various other things. And one of the things we're looking at very closely is how we might... Um, maximize the social impacts of some of our commission contracts with other organizations to ensure that they can offer um, those kind of placements as well as part of the contractual basis uh, difficult to uh, insert that into existing contracts but certainly going forward our intention is that every time we, we go forward with a with a major contract that um, that there would be a social impact um, part of the bidding process that would then uh, we would use hopefully for send um, uh, vocational pathway and uh, corporate parenting as well as the two areas that we're looking at. All right, lovely. I was um, I had a really really lovely chat earlier today with the SIAS team. 
from the council. Um, and, and I think the star of the show was a lovely young lady called Rowan, who now works in the team as, as bank staff, but they were talking about an apprenticeship program they have within that team, actually. Um, so, and, and I think, you know, I was saying for me as a parent to hear that the council, which can be a really, it can be a really faceless and, and quite cruel thing in our lives sometimes to, to hear that it can be a, a force for good and a positive for our young people was really empowering. So I think the idea of having an apprenticeship program there would be just right. brilliant. One of the really key um, pieces of having an apprenticeship program, um, whether it's in Surrey County Council or with other providers, and I know we made the videos available from some of our providers to Lisa, and I think if anyone's got the opportunity to go and, and look at those videos, they're, they're incredibly uplifting, but they're also very informative about, you know, actual uh, feedback from young people who've been on these programs and, you know, the dramatic transformation it's, it's, it's created in their lives and how happy they are in where they are now. Um, but but it's it's also the fact that you know we we in a competitive environment where HR for example says I want the best candidate for the job um, many of our young people will struggle to be successful in that environment. What an apprenticeship program does, or a supported internship program does, is take that competitive element out of it and have earmarked places young people that may not strive you know may not thrive in that environment but once they're given the opportunity you know they will just take off and one of the uh, things that a lot of employers feed back to us is that that by diversifying their workforce by bringing in young people with send many of them will have um, skills that perhaps they don't possess or they change the way that the workplace uh, you know the, the kind of uh, the, the, the way the workplace works you know the way other people uh, react in a really positive way and also some employers have, have seen um, some of our young people potentially for example those with, with uh, autistic spectrum disorder as having a skill set that they can't get anywhere else and the other thing is that many of them will recognize that the you know uh, it, it will in it, it reduces their recruitment costs but they get incredibly loyal employees who will want to work with them and want to stay with them and want to do a good job for many many years so there's lots of benefits to the program but I think sometimes the initial difficulty is that in a competitive environment if you're against someone who's you know not got a special educational need went to a really good school has got great qualifications you know that, that makes it tricky but but we're mm -hmm. working with employers to create specific um, places and opportunities for young people where they can really kind of like thrive and um, in my last local authority we, we had a young man I went name him who uh, we took on as an apprentice and uh, he was he was passionate and I use that word with a capital P about Tottenham Hotspur and he did a customer service apprenticeship and uh, eventually we got him a job in the or he got a job actually I don't say we got him a job he got it himself but he got a job working in the uh, ticket office at uh, Tottenham Hotspur and they were over the moon because they'd never seen anyone who was so enthusiastic about Tottenham it was a uh, it was amazing mm. my cup of tea Tottenham but there you go it's it's really interesting to hear you speak about that because there's that interview phase in there where yes if you're in competition with that kind of really articulate and and fully a leveled up person it's really difficult we we find also that actually for a lot of jobs you have to start with an online questionnaire thing and that can be the first barrier where actually that just doesn't fit well with send and it, it'd be interesting to see how I suppose we can do work with employees to bypass that bit, which can just get one, rid of people. One, the one of the great things about the apprenticeship offer is that most employers now will have, um, if they're of a reasonable size, will have to pay the apprenticeship levy. So the cost of the training element of it is in effect a, a tax that they're already paying if they don't take an apprentice. And uh, a level two apprentice, which is equivalent to five GCSEs, will take about 12 months. Uh, level three, which is equivalent to a level take about three months um, but you're on an apprenticeship contract which means that for the employer um, at the end of the the period of time where they've offered the apprenticeship um, if they don't have an opening or they don't have an opportunity um, they could just say well thanks very much we've really enjoyed your company um, you know but good luck in your next role but but that means that you know they don't have to put in a long-term commitment in terms of you know offering someone a, a, an opportunity for years and years and years it also means that the young person gets that step on the ladder, they get a CV, 
they get work experience, they get a good reference and they get a qualification. And it's yeah. kind of win for everyone really. And but but you know, we do need to do a bit of work with local employers to make them understand the the, the benefits of doing that and actually earmarking specific roles, if you like, for someone either you know who's, who's been uh, in care or has got a special educational need great thank you i'm aware that we're coming to the end of our time i've got one last question from somebody um it, it's talking about for those who've got an ehcp between 16 and 19 particularly they're not on the adult social care pathway we talked about that that it felt a bit like a scrabble and it's a really anxious time and we're not always sure who, as parent carers, but also the young person, who can we look to for support and, and to try and, is, is there any work around reducing anxiety about that transition? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I will say the case officer, and I know sometimes that, you know, it can be quite challenging to get in touch with a case officer. <laughs> I think it's more that, um, you laughed a bit too loud there, Benedict. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, but it's, uh, it, it, you know, that, that really ought to be your first port of call. But actually, as well, it is, as I said earlier, you know, it's it's the school or the college or whoever is working with your young person can give you that information and knowledge. We've obviously got um, SIAS in the council. We're, we're, we're trying to do more work. Um, you know, we, we hope in the future to be able to offer some form of careers offer for young people in that situation. Um, there is the National Careers uh, Service, which obviously has an online offer as well. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but, but there are sources of information out there. But one of the things we're definitely doing within the council is upskilling everyone to be more conscious of that. But I, I think, I know it's going to sound a bit cheesy, but I think the first thing is to ask the question. I think a lot of people think that's a question I would really like answered, but, but are hesitant to ask it. And, uh, and if you do ask that question, you know, even if it does end up that, you know, you're frustrated that no one's given you the answer by asking the question, you know, in effect, you've created an avenue where you can go to. But but I think I don't want to overemphasize it, but sometimes I think if you sit on the other side of the table and you're, you know, you're you're in a job role, um, you know, you might be anxious to ask that question. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're asked it, often you're really happy to even if you can't, you know, immediately say, Oh, actually, I know the answer to that. You can say, well, I'll get that for you and I'll come back to you. And I think, you know, you're asking the questions tonight. I think some of the earlier questions were about, you know, what, what if some of uh, uh, the providers that, that you commission aren't keen on uh, sharing these other um, opportunities? Well, now I'll take that away and I'll think about it and try and come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds a bit twee, but I do think it's partly about asking the question in the first place. Obviously, the case officer should be the first portal call, um, but we will... Um, we, we'll, we'll um, maybe create something like a, a PFA email address where people can send stuff in and then it can be circulated that way. So, yeah, there's definitely uh, more we need to do on that and I'll reflect on it, but but we want people to be as informed as possible and able to access support and answer questions. And maybe it's a frequently asked questions section, I don't know, but we definitely yeah. want to, to beef up the information that we've got available and make it better. And the best way of that is, is people letting us know what they feel they haven't got. Thank you. And I, I think I'd add to that, that one of the one of our roles as the Parent Care Forum is that if we get asked questions, which we so most of you who are watching will know, I rabbit on about this all the time. But we have on our website a form called Tell Us Your Story, and that allows us to collate questions so we can present you if we've had the same question from 10, 20, however many people with every person that asks that same question, it, it lends weight, doesn't it? And it, when we present it to you. If, if I've got 100 people asking the same question, you're going to have more push from us to get a good answer. I'm very aware of your more push uh, conversations, Benedict. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, but it's right that we should be challenged. And, you know, we're here to provide a service. You know, we genuinely want every young person that we've got to be successful as an adult. And if we can find another way of doing that in the way that we haven't done before, or if we can expand some of the programs we've got, or if someone's got an insight that, you know, because of their personal experience that we haven't picked up on, like we really, really want to know it. I mean, obviously we live in a world where there's finite funding, but, but you know, I think there's an awful lot more we can do about the way we spend the, the funding that we've got in a much more kind of outcome focused and, and successful way than, you know, than perhaps we have done in the past. But, 
but you know the programs that we've got in place now are inspired by what other people have asked for and right. you know if we can know more about what people in Surrey you know families in Surrey want then you know we can try and provide it. Brilliant thank you so much Eamon I, I'm really grateful for the time you've given us both for your presentation and this afternoon um, I know we've had all of these questions come in and when when we leave Lisa will be on looking to see how many people we reached um, so thank you so much. I know it takes the, it's quite a thing to come and be grilled without knowing what's coming. So especially I yeah, and, and just to be for transparency, I didn't see any of the questions in advance. So. Absolutely, yeah. yes, I've been and, putting everybody on the spot. And and I will apologise twofold. So obviously I, we're, we're all working from home now, so my, my dog kicked off a little bit earlier, and I've just spotted that I've done the whole thing with the incredible Hulk stuck over my right shoulder. So uh, I hadn't I, noticed, I, but I love that. I do, I do apologize. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so, so much, um, Eamon. I'm going to ask Lisa if she can um, let us say goodbye. And bye bye. This is this is my last one for the week. But all of this work that we're doing on the preparation for adulthood, it's not just this event. It's going to snowball a little bit, I think. Um, and we certainly aren't stopping. Yeah. And can I just say one last thing? Sorry, because you didn't really touch on it. Um, we, we've talked a lot about providers and, and you know, vocational pathways, but, um, you know, we do a lot of work with Halo, for example. Uh, any, any kind of voluntary organisation out there that you think is doing something locally that could contribute to this agenda and we might be able to fund, then if anyone wants to flag that up as well, I'd be really, really happy to hear about that. And as I say, we've really diversified the organisations that we're seeking to work with and fund over the past year, and we want to continue to do that. So great. You know, so I'd say if if any of our members have those ideas, by all means, um, get in touch with us either through the, the tell us your story form or our contact at address and we can make sure we collate everything. And, and I will I will bother Eamon, um, <laughs> as, as I as I sometimes do. <laughs> thank you so, so much, Eamon. Um, Cheers, and thank you. I will wish everybody a good weekend. Cheers. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Bye. And it should stop the live yes no yes it should have stopped the live no oh how strange <laughs>